My name is Sonia. Good morning. Hi, Richard. Good morning. Hello. Good, I thank I you. on the wrong link then. This is the right link, is it, that I had in my uh, calendar? Yes, it's the right link. Good morning, everyone. Hi, good morning. 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 Good morning. We have, um, we have a lot of people joining today, so bear with us a few minutes because we're trying a new format. Um, so hopefully you can, you can see uh, myself and Richard Morris, who's co-hosting with me. Lovely to see Howard Lee as well. Can I see Howard? Great. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Bear with me two minutes um, because yeah. we have a lot of people joining today and we wanted to make it really interactive. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Great. I think we're going to have to do the thumbs up today. There's so many of us. I just give it a couple more minutes. Brilliant. Do we have Rishi? Yes. Yep, I'm on. Hi, Rishi. How are you? Very well, and yourself? Very well. Thank you very much. It's the first time we're meeting, so it's a huge pleasure. A uh, huge pleasure to meet you. We have, uh, I think, circa 400 people who confirmed, so I expect there'll be about a couple of hundred. We have about 100 people already um joining us so uh we're trying a different format today rishi which is to make it as interactive as possible um so i'm gonna i'm gonna kick off actually if i may um so i'm gonna say good morning everyone and uh welcome to today's event in partnership with iwg and also in partnership with deal room um this event um as many of you know is our first what we're calling the e2e unfiltered series and we're um at 10 o'clock we're going to break break everyone up into breakout rooms to do small networking groups under chatham house rules um so my name for those of you that don't know me i'm shalini kempka i'm the founder and chief executive of e2e and it's a huge privilege for me today as i mentioned earlier to be first time in conversation with rishi kosla obe um, he is, as many of you know, the co-founder of Oath North Bank, and it's the UK's leading SME-focused challenger bank. Um, as, as with many industries in recent times, banking is changing, especially SME business banking, and with its unique needs, this br brings fintech into the spot spotlight yet again at the next, as the next big thing. This unique marriage of fintech and banking, tailor-made for SMEs, is a very, very exciting prospect for all entrepreneurs and is exactly what Rishi and Oak North Bank provide and exactly what we as founders, uh, we absolutely need, uh, high-tech organizations such as, as, such as Oak North. Um, the tech industry as a whole is perhaps the only industry that has really thrived and been in a, in a, a major beneficiary of the pandemic, uh, where other industries have, have had a difficult time, especially travel, tourism, and you all know which are the industries that have struggled. But it's the tech giants that um, companies like um, Oak North, Assos, Boohoo, who've helped to keep the UK and be at the forefront of all of this. Um, fin finan fintech and financial services, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is transforming the entire banking industry and the banking system, as well as the high street orientated organizations. And therefore, I think, as we all know, there's a lot of increased uh, importance on digital channels, online and social being socially mobile. And this is needing and reducing the, the need for bricks and mortar, unfortunately. Um, Text helped us to bring us together today, and I'm hoping the technology will work. Um, so as I mentioned, we're working on, on an interactive event this morning. And um, as we prepare for the first time to step out of lockdown, we must continue to explore these many facets and embracing new opportunities and new ideas. And I believe that with COVID, a lot of new opportunities has arisen, even for E2E. We never had 400 people online on, a, on an event before, and hopefully by, by um, in a little bit of time, we'll be at 200. So Rishi Kosla Obi, he has created a new style of niche banking, uh, which is not only a great example of what entrepreneurs need to help them nav navigate the continuing pandemic storm, but he is also a serial entrepreneur with a great deal of wisdom to impart. 
If you're an entrepreneur building, scaling, or selling a business, we hope that you will find the next 80 minutes informative, interactive, and be in touch with us to assist you further. So I have a lot of firsts today. Um, this is our first event of 2021, and it's our first ever interactive event of this type. Um, for the first time, this event will allow our ambassadors, the E2E members, to go into breakout sessions uh, and, and rooms online networking and discussion, and that will begin at 10 o'clock. After, um, it's also the first time that we've formally launched the premium membership. So thank you to those of you that have upgraded from complimentary to premium membership. I think with communities becoming disconnected and even more disconnected during the last three lockdowns across the UK, we felt it was important to encourage entrepreneurs to meet socially, albeit online, and to launch a more premium service for our members. So before I take you through this morning's format, um, our, new, our new membership proposal, I'd just quickly, quickly like to run through the housekeeping for the reception. So my suggestion is that everyone stays muted and thank you for everyone to stay muted except the panel. And um, you're welcome to keep your um, cameras on. After this, we will do an interactive uh, Q&A uh, with Rishi Kostler. So what I would suggest there, if you wouldn't mind, if you manage to look on your um, Zoom accounts, you should see a button called Reactions. On reactions, there's something called raise your hand. And if you have that, then please raise your hand so that you can put forward a question um, to Rishi. If you don't have that function and you have a different version of Zoom, if you hit the participants button, then you'll see on there your name and you can raise your hand, hopefully next to your name. If all else fails, put your hand up like this and we will try and see you to get the questions uh, put forward. Um, I also want to say a huge thank you to the moderators. We've got about 30 moderators today and they're all members and E2E ambassadors. So a massive thank you to you. What you're going to be doing at 10 o'clock is moderating your session and we're going to be discussing one challenge that each of your groups have. Um, so without further ado, um, I wanted to um, just talk to you a little bit about uh, E2E and what we do. And then I'm going to um, thank also uh, Richard Morris. Um, the Today's event and many of our series for the last three years has been partnered with IWG Group. So I'll just thank him in a minute and also Douglas Traffale of Deal Room. So and um, then I will introduce Rishi Kostler. So, um, in terms of the network, um, the network breakout session, uh, we'll begin that at 10 o'clock exactly. But now, quickly, let me share with you a quick summary on E2E. As you know, we're all about enabling entrepreneurship and extraordinary entrepreneurship. Uh, I like to describe us as a match.com for business, um, providing access to human capital, technology capital, and corporate services, as well as financial capital. We take pride in bringing together people. We obviously did a lot of that running 50 events a year uh, when we weren't in COVID. Now it's, it's pretty much online, hopefully until June, uh, when um, the, the Prime Minister has said that things will be able to be relaxed. Um, we take pride in helping you find the right investors, the right talent, and the right corporate services, and turning knowledge into wisdom. That's a part of our ethos and our, our reason for, for, for being, really. So all of this is available at what we call mates rates. It's We've kept the costs very, very low. Uh, we welcome all ambitious entrepreneurs and owners to become E2E ambassadors, which are our members. And at the moment, it's around 24,000 companies that we have as our members. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit, first of all, about the premium membership. The premium membership is an upgrade on the complimentary. If you wish to say complimentary, no problem in that at all. But if you'd like to upgrade, there's around £24,000 worth of free support um, for the premium members. And it's at £25 a month or £300 a year. So if you need investment or uh, access to our mentors, our leaders and our services, um, if you'd like to upgrade, we would welcome that. Um, so. That's a little bit about the membership. Let me just tell you about Richard Morris, and I'm going to move over to Richard in a second. Richard is the chief executive of IWG Group. It is the world's largest co-working hub. They have revolutionized and changed the way that they do business during COVID. Um, if you Google Mark Dixon, you will hear how he's talking about the future of work and how things have changed. And Richard's going to touch on some of the packages and offers that we have exclusively for our members. Uh, now, if you need access to data, um, there is no better company, we think, than Deal Room in the UK. Um, Deal Room is one of the, the top companies here to provide part, um, private market data. So they have a partnership with us. So if you're looking for data, 
um, please do talk to us and we can introduce you to Deal Room or help you with some of the data. I think this is particularly useful when you're fundraising, when you're looking to sell a business, because you can do a lot of comparisons using Deal Room. So that's a little bit about the format. And I'd like to now ask um, Richard to say a few words about the partnership, and then we'll move on to Doug, and he's going to share some slides with us. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I am Richard, huge thank you to you. Thank you, Shalini. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hope you're all well. Um, as Shalini said, uh, I, I'm from International Workplace Group, IWG, uh, and what we do very simply is we're, we're repackaging the way in which workspace is offered for use by businesses of all different kinds, from sole traders, freelancers, SMEs, scale-ups, all the way up to the largest companies in the world. And we're doing that by building out a global network of on-demand workspace. So we've spent several years investing heavily in building that network. Today, it's around three and a half thousand locations in 120 countries, 1500 cities. All of that is accessible at the touch of a button on a smartphone app. Uh, if you go to the Apple store, the Android store, download the Regis app, click on find workspace and you can find private office, a hot desk, meeting room, a training room, and you can consume this high quality workspace conveniently located with a very big emphasis on design and usability all at the touch of a button. Why are we doing that? Very simply because we feel that the old traditional way of providing workspace is completely irrelevant to businesses in the 21st century. The idea of having to go through all of the hassle of signing a long-term commitment, which in today's world, of course, businesses want to be agile and flexible. So we really are focused on providing workspace when companies need it, where they need it, for how long they need it, uh, on a very flexible basis. And we think off the back of the, the terrible uh, pandemic crisis, providing office space in a flexible way will become more relevant uh, than ever before. Just to highlight that over the last six months, we've been working with a wide variety of different types of business for them to respond to the impact of the pandemic on how their people will work in the future. And we know that, of course, we've had this huge forced global work from home experiment, which will leave uh, a lasting impact on how people actually work. And our view is that there will no longer be this continual, steady rush into the company head office on a morning, Monday to Friday, that work in the future will be much, much more distributed it will be nearer to home for much of the time. It will be from home some of the time. And, and companies will have smaller size presence in large cities. So we think our network of on-demand space uh, can help companies, can help them be more efficient, more productive, uh, and can help them be more uh, uh, smart when it comes to being able to adopt these flexible uh, work practices. So we've signed some big deals in the last few months with uh, Standard Chartered Bank, with Nestle, enabling them to have their global workforces of tens of thousands of people use our network on a membership subscription basis, being able to access one of our locations uh, near to where they live or near to where they need to work. Uh, the final thing to say about what we do is we do it under a number of different brands, uh, we have different formats, different types of location, because not all customers want the same thing. In the UK, we operate uh, just under 400 locations under brands, including Spaces, The Clubhouse, Base Point, Central Working, HQ, and Regis. Um, so they all come together to form uh, this amazing network of high quality on-demand workspace. For our partnership with E2E, which we're, we're very proud to partner uh, with E2E, we, we think there's a, a real relevance to us providing uh, our physical infrastructure to E2E 
uh, as the, this sort of fantastic network of scalar entrepreneurs. We provide benefits to E2E members. Um, and uh, if you are a, a member of E2E, then we can offer uh, fantastic packages, including three months free uh, on any of our packages, as, as long as you sign up for at least six months. Uh, so that's up to a 50% discount. That might be a, a business address and a, and a, and a pay-as-you-go hot desk, or it could be a private office. We're also offering uh, discounts on our meeting rooms. So we have meeting rooms in every location uh, and where you can find uh, discounts of 10% on, on those products and services. And in addition to that, we're offering all E2E members free access to our business lounge network. Again, all, all stuff that you can find on the app. Uh, and we're delighted uh, to be able to do that, especially in these current times when people are working differently. So please download the app uh, and hopefully you can find out more from doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. I really appreciate it. We've, we're absolutely delighted um, to be partnering with you again this year. So uh, thank you for your support. And, and I think as things free up, we're going to see a lot of people availing a lot of these offers. So uh, uh, we're looking forward to, to building that with you this year, um, as well as, as some of the, the, the events program that we're putting on together. I think our next event is with uh, Kim Morris. Um, um, she has uh, co-founded Ground Control and she's speaking on the 17th of March. But, but without further ado, I'm going to move over to Doug Traffile. Um, Doug, we need to we need to just quickly run through your 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 data. We're looking forward to your data, and then uh, we'll we'll have Rishi on. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, of course. Good morning, everyone, and Shalini, and everyone uh, from EDE. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, uh, quick technical question: Do you guys have the slides? Uh, there we go. Perfect. I didn't know if I was going to share my screen. So I was asked to join this morning uh, to uh, shed uh, a spotlight on uh, what's going on in uh, European and UK fintech. Uh, I'm the chief commercial officer at a company called Deal Room. We are based in Amsterdam, although uh, I live in London. And we consider ourselves the foremost data provider of early stage startups and scale ups uh, in Europe and, and certainly with global coverage as well. Uh, we've been around for uh, just over eight years and have amassed a database of 1.5 million companies uh, with a specialty in identifying companies that are tech enabled, uh, ones that are of interest uh, to uh, venture investors, corporates, uh, service providers who are all looking uh, to be a part of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. And as part of that, we're able to uh, put together some very nice data that allows uh, investors uh, and uh, entrepreneurs to have a really good sense of what's going on in the market. So why don't we jump into the slides? What we put together here is a look at uh, uh, Europe's uh, largest investment categories. Uh, and if we look at FinTech on the left there, uh, since uh, 2014 has received uh, 35 billion uh, euros in investment, uh, which is the largest, uh, slightly more than uh, health uh, and enterprise software, and certainly uh, gaps above the likes of uh, transportation, food, marketing, energy, and travel. And then to the right there, if we look at the number of funding rounds uh, above uh, 2 million, uh, we see uh, FinTech at the top as well, uh, not the very top, but in the top three categories, again, alongside of uh, enterprise software uh, and health. So certainly uh, there's a lot of uh, innovation happening in the space and a lot of uh, institutional capital uh, getting behind uh, all sorts of companies. Uh, within. And if we look at the next slide, we can break down FinTech into different categories. Uh, we'll see uh, that within European fintech, retail, uh, SME banking are by far the largest areas of investor interest, uh, with investment growing uh, five times uh, between uh, 2006 and 2019. Uh, following that, uh, again, with a bit of a gap, are insurance, corporate banking, technology, and so forth. Slide, please. And then finally, if we look at uh, fintech, uh, not uh, necessarily by uh, uh, category within fintech, uh, but uh, by a country, the United Kingdom, for anyone who follows it, uh, is by far uh, the leader in fintech uh, startups, uh, but also investments, which certainly go hand in hand. Uh, and amazingly, so far this year, which has been uh, 
about seven weeks or eight weeks, I think, we've already had 1.7 billion euros invested in the United Kingdom alone uh, in fintech. So again, fintech is certainly a hot category and also uh, within the United Kingdom. Slide, please. And the UK has produced 26 fintech unicorns, uh, and that's more than Israel has produced across every sector. And so there's certainly going to be some names there that you guys would be familiar with, uh, including Wise, which is uh, used to be TransferWise. It's uh, filing for its IPO. Uh, and we've got Revolut. Uh, and of course, on there, we have Oak North, which Rishi would know. Uh, and we can uh, pass that along uh, here. If you guys want uh, anyone in the audience interested in a copy of the slides or uh, would like to speak more about Deal Room and what we do, uh, please get in touch. I'm happy to uh, share that as well. We do offer a freemium model such that you can uh, sign up for an account uh, and have uh, the ability to look around at different companies and do searches and such. So I encourage you to go to dealroom.co uh, and set up an account if it's of interest. Shalini, thank you. Doug, thank you very much. Well, I noted there that you said that uh, uh, fintech, we're the European leader in fintech. Rishi, the challenge now is whether we can use you as a role model to make sure that the UK is the global leader in fintech. How's that as a challenge? It's a good challenge. There's, there's a slight <laughs> scale um, imbalance with certain countries, but, but we can go into that. Okay, thank you very much. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my huge pleasure now to um, formally introduce uh, Rishi Kosla. Uh, Rishi Kosla OB, who is the, the, the leader and innovator in, in fintech. Um, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, he's the CEO and co-founder of the UK's uh, leading SME-focused challenger bank, Oak North, uh, which only began in late 2015. So the story has just been unbelievable in terms of how, Rishi, you've grown the business in such a short period of time. He's a British Indian, which I'm very proud of, uh, and a serial startup entrepreneur. He's, um, as I mentioned, co-founding Oak North with uh, Joel Perlman. And uh, I've not had the opportunity to meet you or Joel, but I want to congratulate you both for what you're doing in terms of um, um, making the UK a much more um, innovative hub um, in terms of technology. The bank is the next generation credit platform that's redefining lending to fast growth businesses and entrepreneurs, as well as providing uh, other banking services. In September 2016, Oak North announced it had broken, broken even, um, becoming the first um, completely new bank to achieve this in under one year in the UK. In five short years, um, now with more than 175,000 saving customers and having lent several billion pounds to British business. Um, it has grown into one of the UK's most valuable tech unicorns, valued at $2.8 billion, and with six UK-wide regional hubs. In 2016, working closely with Amazon Web Services, Oak North became the first UK bank to have their credit intelligence suite fully hosted on the cloud, which I think was a very, very smart move. In 2020, the Financial Times ranked them as the number one uh, um, on the FTSE 1000, um, Europe's fast and growing companies uh, uh, on, that, on that list. And, in, and since January 2020, they've um, counted as the, um, by the former UK Chancellor, Philip Hammond, as part of the advisory board. Um, Rishi was previously co-founder of, of Copal Amber, a financial services company and research company that was scaled to 3,000 employees and so to, sold to Moody's Corporation in 2014. He's also an active venture investor and provided early stage funding uh, into PayPal and India Bull. So he's got that keen investment eye for spotting the right businesses. And um, Rishi, I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about you. So I'd like to first of all, thank you and give you a very warm welcome. As you can see, there's a lot of people online very keen to talk to you. Um, but if, 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 if I may, should I kick off with a few questions? Would you like to say anything or would you like me to kick off? Sure, you can actually kick off. I'd, said, I'd say that you set the bar so high, but you have to realize I'm just a crappy entrepreneur. So maybe you need to manage expectations here. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, so let, if, may, could we begin, if you wouldn't mind, by asking about your journey? Why did you choose and why did you want to be an entrepreneur? And how did you take the employee, um, the, the, the leap from becoming an employee from an employee to entrepreneur and then we'll go more into um, um, what you've done with Oak North Bank so just your sort of journey would be great Rishi and why you made those choices. 
Sure. So, so I think I decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur probably at the age of eight or nine. Um, and I'd always, I sort of always had a drive to, to sort of create and, um, and I guess just from a very young age, I'd, I'd set my mind on that. So, um, when I, when, when I started, I, I did, I, I, I worked at, at a couple of firms before, before becoming an entrepreneur, but I almost viewed that as continued education to help set me up to, for, for a lot of the learnings I would need to create an organization. Um, so, so I guess the bug has been in me from a very, very young age. Okay. Um, so the ambition was all, always there. So with, um, could you talk to us a little bit about your first um, um, business that you sold um, to Moody's about um, Cocoa Partners and uh, what happened there and what that business was about? Sure. Um, so, so in short, Copal started. The concept was really simple. Um, I, 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 I disliked being a, an investment banking analyst as my first job um, in terms of the hours you put in, the type of work you do, and and I guess just the just the whole grind of it. It taught me an immense amount. So I, I always say I would choose it every time again. But as after going through that experience, I said to myself, there's a better way to do this. There's a better model. And actually, if you created a business which actually provided that infrastructure to be able to do a lot of that analyst associate support for investment banks, um, you could actually change change the way that the cost structure operates, but also um, the efficiency of the process. So that was really the original seed of the idea uh, behind Copal. We started um, Joel and I started that business. So Joel, so Joel has been my co-founder on both Copal and, and Oak North. Um, we started that business when when we pretty much had no capital behind us. Um, so we we raised um, a total of uh, 185,000 pounds from friends and family to start the business. Um, ultimately, that's what it took to to scale the business. I mean, we we ended up only actually using 40,000 pounds of that in total. Um, to build the business. So we, we really bootstrapped it and incredibly, um, uh, how can I put it, uh, um, incredibly rigorous manner. Um, and, and I guess the thing, as I always say, when, when you don't have a safety blanket, the, there's only a plan A, there is no plan B, and therefore you have to make it work. Um, and, and that's exactly the mode which we were in um, when we were building Copal. Thank you. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then when did you decide, I think it was in 2014, you decided to sell the business. Uh, what was the thinking, at, uh, and, and uh, especially at that particular time? Sure. Um, I mean, look, the, the biggest test for us as a business was going through 2008, right? Um, so servicing investment banks uh, primarily, but also some asset managers. And obviously going into the financial crisis um, was, was a hairy moment. Uh, mm -hmm. We managed to continue growing the business through that period at, at a slower rate. So we were used to going 50, 60% a year. And at that point we grew, I think at 30, just, just shy of 30% um, during 2008 and 2009, uh, but we still maintained th th that level of growth. So when we came out of that, our view was actually, we've got, a, we've got a solid business which has proven itself and proven the ability to scale in good and bad times. Um, and, and, and we said to ourselves, actually, this is great. We're going to, we're going to continue to build this forever. And mm -hmm. like with anything, you sort of, <laughs> we got, we continually got inbound offers and, and, and sort of um, requests to have discussions. And ultimately, I guess there was a transaction on the table, which we just felt was too, too good to, to pass by. So we hadn't, we've, I mean, both with Copal and, and today with Oak North, our attitude is always that we're building a company for life. Mm -hmm. um, where we're not building a company to trade out of. Um, but ultimately, with Copal, there, there was a, a very attractive offer, which, which was on the table for us. And that was Moody's. Exactly. Great. So in um, previous interviews, um, Rishi, you've said that you took the weekend off um, before you started Oak North. Um, so obviously, you didn't take much of a break. So how, how um, I guess a lot of entrepreneurs will be thinking that, you know, you've, you've exited really well. You've had a big scale exit to Moody's. You've worked really hard for a long period of time. Why start again and not actually just enjoy the exit? Um, um, so what was the, why did you decide so quickly to move into your next big thing? So, so look, there, I'd, I'd say a few things. So um, I, 
I, I believe a, a lot of entrepreneurs have two modes, which is on either on or off. And I, I prefer on than off. Um, and the, I, I sort of, as I said, the plan was never really to sell the business. The plan was to continue building it. Uh, I have to say one of the, one of the toughest days in my life was probably when the transaction closed. Um, and, and yes, a lot of money came in, but on the other side, you sort of felt like, okay, now you sort of don't have what you built. So in a way you feel like, well, I felt like I'm going to start counting backwards from that day. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I prefer not to count backwards. So, um, too young as well. Way too young. Um, yes. As I say, the, I, I hope to I hope to be working until un, until I pass. Um, so, so, so my attitude is very simple. That you know, again, too much to do, um, too much energy, and and also look, we we'd experienced the problem which we're solving with Oak North ourselves in two thousand and five when we were building Copal. So we were very we were very clear that there's a a very big scale opportunity which actually is also a good thing to solve for economies, for communities. Um, so both it's a way to actually do good and also build what we hoped would be, would be a very successful business. Um, so the drive of that was, was infectious for us. I know that makes a lot of sense. And then you talk often about the missing middle. So I, I'd like to move on to some of um, Oak North's um, services. And really, I think what the um, uh, audience is wanting to understand is how is Oak North different, really different? Uh, there's so many fintech businesses out there today. And what is the missing middle that you refer to quite often? Sure. So. So, so let me break this down. So let me give, again, let me give the, the quick genesis of the idea. So um, as I mentioned, um, the, the original seed of the idea came when we were building Copal in 2005. We were, we were growing at an incredible clip and we had at any point two to three weeks of working capital in the bank. And for all of those of you who, who run businesses sort of know that's not very prudent. Mm -hmm. um, so we said to ourselves, it would be good to get a line of credit effectively as a contingency if, if a customer doesn't pay on time, at least we can make payroll. Um, and we went to a commercial bank um, and got a, got a computer says no type response, went to another commercial bank, got the same response. And a few months later, we ended up in the special situations desk of one of our clients who gave us a hundred times the amount of debt to take out as a dividend. So we said to ourselves, it's incredible that actually we have what we viewed as a very um, as a very debt worthy, as in a company which had the ability to take on debt. Um, commercial banks couldn't actually get their head around lending to us, but an institutional player could and actually lent us a hundred times the amount to take out as a dividend. So, so that was the original seed of the idea. And, and if I come to answering your question around the missing middle, the missing middle for us are businesses which are fundamentally in scale up mode, where you're probably too big to get the types of services which you feel are appropriate from a commercial bank, but you're probably too small to get treated like a corporate. And it's really the corporate service which you want, but in a way which is obviously suited, su suited to your institution. And, and we just feel like the, the, the lending sector, the banking sector just doesn't service scale up businesses well in that regard. And, and, and that's what we focus on. So we don't focus on startup, right? Um, it is very much this scale up, what we call the missing middle. So which fits in between sort of where branches don't service you well and you're, and you're fundamentally too small for large corporate uh, lending desks. Okay, no, that, that's very, very clear. And I think um, there's gonna be a few more questions around that from the audience in a minute. May I go on to something else that everybody's been asking me when they knew that you were speaking is how did you raise so much money so quickly? Um, and uh, you know, and what enticed you to work with um, SoftBank and what was the journey? Because um, we'd all like to kind of copy that <laughs> and, 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 and seek good funding from, um, as fast as possible. So we'd love you to share that story with us, Rishi. Sure. So, so the irony is, um, as I said, previous business, total capital raised £185,000 primary and total capital used £40,000. Oak North numbers are slightly different. 
so so circa, circa a billion uh, dollars raised in equity. Um, we started the business with our own money. So, you know, we, we were the first investors, Joel and I. Uh, and, and I would say that we, we clearly had a very, have a very clear vision of the part of the market we're focused on. Um, we clearly had a very frugal attitude even whilst building Oak North. Um, and that's why we obviously reached profitability so break even in nine months um, of inception. Um, the, the whole raising capital for me comes almost as a function of doing what you say you're going to do and having people see that you've done what you say you're going to do and hopefully more. Um, and therefore, having a group of investors who sort of heard the story and within months could see things actually accelerating and developing beyond what we'd actually said, in my way, in, in my view, is, is always the best way to raise money. Have people sort of live with you, track you for a period and actually see you execute because ultimately I think everything comes down to execution. Mm -hmm. um, so beyond that, I would say just an immense amount of luck, which I always, always <laughs> recommend. <laughs> um, we bring our own luck. Um, so I think, uh, yes, there is luck always in the journey. We bring our own luck. It's what was the magnet? Why, why did SoftBank agree to put in so much money when you were so young? So, I mean, look, the, the reality of the, the soft, soft bank investment is that we were already uh, fully, we were obviously profitable, but we also were fully funded for our business plan before SoftBank actually came in. Um, so, therefore, actually, the, the whole discussions with SoftBank were, how can we take a, a material amount of money and accelerate our plans and effectively dial up our whole, uh, our whole sort of ambition as such. Um, so, so from that perspective, it was a very good conversation. Um, and, and, and look, ultimately, you've obviously within SoftBank got p individuals who understand finance very well, who also understand technology very well. And again, in terms of sort of just the area that we're focused on, there aren't a lot of fintech businesses who have narrowed down on fundamentally commercial lending as, as their focus. There are a lot of fintech businesses which are focused on small business lending, right? Mm -hmm. But small business yeah. lending is very different, i.e. lending 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 is very, very different from the area that, that Oak North sort of uh, plays in. Yes, no, that makes a lot of sense. Rishi, thank you very much for sharing that with us. I'm conscious of time. I'm going to ask Stephen to put on the poll because I want to get um, everybody uh, involved in the conversation with you now. I've got a whole list of questions, but uh, I'm going to open it up to, um, um, first of all, I think Lord Lee uh, wanted to ask a question, but can we, um, Stephen, can we quickly have the poll up? Thank you. Uh, guys, if you wouldn't mind just to take two seconds to go through this, we'll go through it quickly. I think there's about seven questions. Currently, what's your main challenge? I think on this one, if you could pick your main challenge. Stephen, should we go on to the next question? I tell you what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave the, um, the poll questions running in the background whilst we open up for Q&A. Um, I know that um, Lord Lee wanted to um, talk to you. He's in the House of Lords today talking about FinTech. So, um, Lord Lee, are you are you there? Sure, sure. You thank you. Thank you asked you. me to talk about the challenges facing thank fintech, you. particularly from a, a legal political perspective. And uh, I thought I'd touch on a couple of things that are going to be very relevant to people. The first is the extension of the moratorium under the insolvency laws, which means that uh, companies are going to get uh, a softer treatment for a few months. But people who have started up a business fairly recently and haven't been through a few cycles will discover to their horror that most companies go bust as you come out of a recession. And uh, the banker, Rishi, will know this and over trade and get short of cash coming out of a recession. And your biggest risk right now is what's going to happen uh, as your customers give you lots of orders and you over trade and run out of cash. And for that reason, people need to be super prepared. Yes, you need to have proper facilities from your bank, 
but there's a limit to what banks can do. And that's why you've seen so many tech companies raising equity. And uh, certainly at FinCap, we've seen a huge explosion of tech companies looking to raise equity to see them through the next few months. So first lesson for entrepreneurs is make sure you've got, uh, FinTech entrepreneurs is make sure you've got enough equity. The mm -hmm. other uh, the worry on the horizon is the National Security and Investment Bill, which is literally going through the Lords this week and next, and I, I will be speaking on it. And this is a very worrying bill for every fintech entrepreneur because it enables the Secretary of State to uh, call in any transaction without size limit. It can be uh, a million pound transaction, call in that transaction to review it, stop it, consider it in 17 sectors, which basically covers the whole of tech. And uh, uh, it, it's uh, of, of any size. You can take, uh, you can sell, you can seek to sell a twenty percent stake in your business, and the mm -hmm. Secretary of State can say no. I want it called in for review for thirty days. So uh, we're doing our best to try and reduce, reduce the scope, but it is it is obviously a, count, is a counter to the Huawei mm -hmm. situation, and it's obviously to stop certain foreign states investing in fintech businesses. But it is a threat to the fabulous environment that we've created in the UK for uh, uh, inward investment. Um, and lastly, I'd say, well, you know, hats off to Rishi for what he's done. Uh, uh, Rishi, the, the environment is so different from when you started your first business. In those days, there were four banks, uh, you could only four you could go to, and three of whom always said no. So you pretty much, you, now the mark, I mean, we, we have a whole team of people at FinCap trying to work out which bank is right for for your particular proposition. So are you worried that the explosion of all these banks will mean that a number of them just won't make it and there's gonna be some chaos in the market? And do you think people do spend sufficient time going around the market, finding the right package for themselves? So, so Howard, thank you. Um, so my view is, is that if you think about when we got our banking license, we were the third new bank in 150 years to have received a new banking license. And since then, clearly, there have been a number of other banks um, which, which have got new banking licenses. Um, again, not, I, I don't actually know the exact number if you exclude sort of the foreign subs of, um, of, of other larger banks. Um, it's, still, it's still sort of, I think, sort of in the ream of 10, 15 or so. But when any market opens and you get a number of new startups, you're inevitably not going to have every startup succeed. Right. So you're just going to expect that some of those just don't execute um, as as expected and therefore sort of don't make it. And some of them will. Right. And and, and, and clearly, from my perspective, I hope more do than not. Um, the the function of that ultimately should lead to better choices for businesses and consumers. Right. Because ultimately adding competition is all about that. It already has clearly spurned the larger banks to actually take more notes and, in a way, wake up to a potential competitive threat, which they've never had. Okay, Hold on a second. Those are both positive, right? Again, for for ultimately the customer. Um, on a practical basis, when I when I look at Oak North and I look at sort of the the competitive um, aspect that we we face, I would say that we we get competition on almost on a level basis, but we don't have any direct peer or player who's continually coming up in competition with us. So it's very, very widespread for us. And, and, and that still shows, at least from our perspective, that we are filling a void, um, which, which at the moment, I, I think we've got leadership in. Thank you, Rishi. Howard, did you want to say anything further on that? Um, because I'll, I'll move on to questions. I want to say thank you for joining us. And um, thank you for pushing this forward at the House of Lords today. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Um, I know that Andrew Yates, he's put a question in. Andrew, are you, are you available? If you wouldn't mind to un unmute. And then if anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. So after Andrew, we'll go to Glenn Smith of Rocket. So uh, thank you, Shalini. Hi, uh, hi, Rishi. Um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, your plans um, uh, around scaling Oak North in the US. I know you've got an, some interesting activities going on. I know Peter Grant quite well. So, OK, excellent. Peter's amazing. Um, yeah. So 
we obviously took the approach of building our own bank in the UK um, to, to solve the missing middle or, or lending for the missing middle. Our approach outside of the UK is actually to take the technology platform which we've created and provide that to other commercial banks to enable them to become better at servicing this particular segment. And the, the key market for us is the US market. And that's exactly what we're doing. We fundamentally wrapped our product into an enterprise SaaS offering and offering that to large and small banks. So, you know, the largest banks that we service are within the top five in the US and the smallest are ones which are one, two billion in, in assets. Um, and for us, that's an incredibly scalable way to actually have the impact that we want in terms of plugging this, um, this gap in, in the missing middle without actually building out sort of large regulatory and capital intensive infrastructure, which obviously a bank requires. Thank you. Andrew, does that, does that answer your question? You're still on mute. It does. Thank you very much. Great. Great I'm going to move over. Nice to see you, Andrew, and uh, um, wishing you every success with Artesian. So uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to move over to Robert Kilgour, followed by Glenn Smith, followed by Freddie Talberg. So I'm getting everyone ready. Um, followed by Ed Gemmel, followed by Dan Alper, uh, and then I'll tell you some more. So um, maybe I could move over to Robert. Robert, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Shalini. Uh, and hi, Rishi. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, UK entrepreneurs will be really the engine of growth to grow the economy out of COVID. And w the Chancellor needs in his budget to fire us up, not get us sitting back, um, uh, fire us up moving forward, not get us sitting back, treading water, saying, oh, we'll, we'll just um, tread water for the next couple of years, that'd be disastrous for growing the economy. Can you give us some of your sort of budget predictions and also budget fears um, and whether you agree with um, the, the fact that we, we need to be fired up, not, not sitting back? Uh, can so, I add one? Sorry, before you say, Rishi, can I ask you also to talk about what you think about capital gains tax? Sure. Should it go up? Uh, so, so Robert, I was just going to, again, repeat what I said. I'm just a scrappy entrepreneur, so I'm not going to give you budget predictions. Uh, <laughs> I, I absolutely concur with you that actually firing up entrepreneurs and, and spurring that and maintaining the environment yeah. and, and maintaining an attractive environment to get entrepreneurs from other countries to actually come and establish themselves yeah. and build businesses in the UK is exactly what I think the UK should be doing. And at least the, the little time which I spend with government is, is, is really trying to promote that um, agenda, as in like the UK, I started venture investing back in 2000. And out of like 27, 28 investments I made, I only did one in the UK, right? Because the entrepreneurial culture in the UK just wasn't anything as it was as in the US and, and for me in India. Um, today, that is very different. Right. We over the last five, seven, eight years, we've just created this incredible environment to both start and build businesses. I still think we haven't done enough to actually scale true global scale um, uh, to reach global scale for UK businesses, because often I would, I would argue that UK businesses sell out too soon. Um, but if you put that aside, creating that environment, I think, is absolutely the thing the government should be doing. And, and as I said, so, so I fully, fully support that. In terms of capital gains tax, I think it directly links into that, right? I mean, if you're, if you're fundamentally going to um, increase capital gains tax, that's clearly not the best way to incentivize entrepreneurs to come and establish and build their businesses in the UK, right? Um, and I think, and, and I clearly uh, believe the Chancellor knows that. Um, but, but obviously you've got, you've got the complexity of the fact that we do have an incredibly low capital gains tax in comparison to a number of other markets. And the question is, is that a good place to raise revenue at a time when, when it's needed? And, and again, my view is, I think, I, I think that that takes away from the multiplier effect of having entrepreneurs build their businesses in the UK. Thank maybe you. corporation tax, maybe corporation tax would be a better thing to increase for the period that we need. 
so I think I think the fact, and again, I said I'm not going to make any predictions, but uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I think I think the corporation tax is is almost or, or almost certainly going to increase, in my view, and and that's simply because when when there's been talk of increasing increasing corporation tax, the the Institute of Directors, etc., no one's really come out aggressively, sort of um, saying that would be a bad idea. And therefore, it just seems like a very easy take. So yeah. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Robert. Thank you very much, Robert. Rishi, thank you for your response on that. Freddie, should we move over to you? We're going to have to keep the questions short and the answers short. We've got a lot of people. Uh, we've yeah. got 10 minutes remaining. Um, yeah. two, two simple questions, really. Uh, Rishi, hi, it's Freddie. Um, um, the first one is challenger. Uh, the first one is challenger banks in relation to asset financing. Is, is asset financing a sort of thing that uh, the challenger banks can deliver because we're sort of struggling uh, with, with that in some ways? And secondly, uh, I've, um, I've, I've, I've bought in the, the, the concept of challenger banks and I've set up and I've used two challenger banks, you know, Metro and Tide. But when the push came to shove, when we tried to get a bounce back loan off our Tide account, we got rejected because the Tide didn't get the support from the government and all sorts of challenges. So. So when we sort of did the stuff with the challenger banks, we realized actually they weren't really big enough to handle stuff. And so in the end, we had to go and get a feeder account from one of the big four to, to get our bounce back loan through that. It, it, so it was so disappointing for us as entrepreneurs going, actually, we'll, we'll follow the challenger bank. But when it pushed come to shove, we didn't really get the funding. And it's like, you know, I felt really, really deflated, even though Metro were awesome. Mm -hmm. they, they did Thanks, really Freddie. Good. Sorry, uh, Freddie, I'm going to ask Rishi to answer so, you. So, Freddie, what I would say to that very quickly is that, uh, look, I think that we didn't set ourselves up to be a full service bank, right? Um, and we, we're very focused on the niche that, we, that we're um, uh, about, so i.e. the missing middle and lending to the missing middle. So even when we lend, we generally don't take the banking relationship, so we don't take the transaction account or anything, right? And therefore, I think with a lot of fintech players, it's sort of like there's a niche which they perform extremely well at, but the concept of actually having a full service from one institution, at least with a lot of fintechs, I don't think is necessarily the objective that they, that they set out to. And I think that's an evolution for a lot of entrepreneurs as well to say, actually, I don't need to do everything with one institution, but I can actually do different things with different institutions, depending on what they're good at. Thank you. Rishi, thank you very much. Um, Freddie, I'm going to move on, if I may, to Glenn Smith. Glenn, hi, good to see you. Hey, good to be here. Uh, hey, Rishi, just to be very, take on that point, actually, um, to help, what's the ideal customer for Oak North as a, as a, as a, as a startup that's looking to expand? What, what's the level that we need to get to? Or what's your ideal uh, customer to finance via Oak North? Sorry, in terms of, in terms of um, our, in terms of our borrowers, in terms of the ideal size? Yeah, in terms of the profile of the business that you would, the characteristics of the business you would look for oh. before you would extend. Oh, look, I mean, we, we, in the UK, we clearly are a bank. We clearly, therefore, provide senior debt. So this isn't mezzanine. This isn't venture debt. Um, they are tip so our clients typically scale up businesses. The the range is anywhere from companies with a million pounds turnover all the way to a hundred million pounds turnover. Right, so a, a pretty large range. Um, the quantum which we lend goes anywhere from about a million pounds up to about forty million pounds. Um, uh, to, 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 to a particular company. Um, and the, the profiles fundamentally businesses which are generally in growth mode, but clearly have earnings, so therefore do have debt capacity, right? And I think the worst thing any, any entrepreneur can do is take debt when they should be taking equity, right? But if you do have debt capacity as a business, what we do do is where we structure loans in a way which actually enables your growth. So if, if today at a, at a high street bank, they'd lend you five million pounds, what we would probably do is put a structured loan in place, which may allow you to draw five million day one, but actually give you a 15 million pound line or something. So as you continue to grow, you can effectively tap the line as you grow, rather than having to go back and renegotiate every time, et cetera. So what I always say is most, most commercial banks only look backwards at your historic results, right? We spend a lot of time looking forwards. 
right? And we spend a lot of time on the scenarios of actually how the forward look looks. And we combine the historic and the forward look together to structure a loan, which actually makes sense for your business. Thank you. Thank you. Is that, is that giving you the sufficient answer? Yeah, that was a yeah. great answer. Thank you. Uh, that's great. May I ask Alpa Raja and then Alpha, after Alpa, uh, I think we're going to go on to Ed Gemmel and Nathan Hill and Damar Shakemka. We've only got five more minutes. Um, quick questions, Rishi. Um, I just wanted to know, are there any target markets um, that you would just stay away from as we're coming out um, of the doldrums? And the other question was, in terms of the C-bill loans, um, there seems to be a mad rush to get those in. Do you think if they're horribly um, being demonstrated to the banks that they'll then go after the professional advisors that are backing the forecast going forward? So having professional indemnity claims against them? So, so on the first thing in terms of sectors, we within our framework, what we've done is split the economy into 262 different subsectors. And we've created effectively forward-looking views for each of those subsectors based, I mean, and we've been maintaining this infrastructure through the whole COVID period. So we've effectively had the reboot period um, and, and, and our view of the new normal in each, each of those subsectors, right? So whereas a normal institution would sort of say, I'm gonna red light hospitality, for example, or retail, and we're not gonna do anything there. Our view is much more nuanced where we will do, and we've continued to do things in hospitality and in retail, right? But there are in niches which we believe are going to come out actually on top rather than in a way sort of be, be, be somewhat decimated. Um, so, so my view on that is that yes, there are gonna be clearly sectors which win and lose, um, but our approach is very nuanced rather than a typical uh, lending institution, which let's say breaks the world into 10 or 12 sectors. In terms of sort of the, the C-bills loans, um, uh, I think that every lending institution has to have done their own underwriting. So therefore the reliance on professional advisors, I think is, is, is fundamentally the only place where you actually apply reliance is typically on property lending against uh, valuers, right? Outside of that, um, even if you get, you're getting financial due diligence, et cetera, done externally, typically the reliance level that you can put on that is very limited. And it, or from a C-bills perspective, it requires an institution to undergo their own underwriting and therefore make their own decision. So I don't, I don't see that as linked. Do I see litigation? Do I see issues around um, the government programs generally? Yes, I do, but that's for not following eligibility criteria or, or, or effectively obviously fraud, in, in, especially in the bounce banking space. Thank you, Alpa. Thank you very much, Rishi. Thanks for your response. I'm gonna move on to uh, Ed Gemmel and then um, my mother, Dame Asha Kemka. So uh, um, Ed, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Shalina. Um, hi, Rishi. Um, yes, I've got a slightly different question to everybody else. Um, we're currently in the middle of a, a climate emergency. We've got a 2050 net zero target. Most climate scientists are now saying 2030 net zero is the only practical way to keep us safe. Um, in your values, you state that you're providing lending services in an environmentally responsible way. Would you mind explaining how you're doing that and perhaps sure. provide some indication of your leadership in the area? So, Ed, so basically um, 2019 was the first year when we became scope one and scope two um, net, net neutral, um, which we believe makes us one of the first um, banks to, to have reached that. Um, we've been putting a program together for scope three, um, and that obviously requires us to get our clients to effectively um, net, net neutral. Um, that's a program which we were hoping to launch um, middle of last year for obvious reasons that ended up getting delayed um, because our clients had a lot of, you know, sort of survival on their, on their minds. Um, so that's something which we're launching um, in, in the next months. Um, and the, the, the view is to firmly get off the, off the ground in 21. So ultimately we want to become scope one, two, three neutral. Um, in addition to that, we've, in, in, in the same way that I talked about sort of splitting the economy into these 262 subsectors, we're effectively creating transitionary and physical risk um, criteria across all of these 262 subsectors to use as a stress testing framework for both our institution, but also for the, the commercial banks which we lend to, sorry, that we provide our software to, um, to effectively raise, and, uh, raise the awareness of actually the financial impact of climate and based on different scenarios. 
So, so in short, we think we're doing a lot in this space where um, it's a space that we absolutely think being good corporate citizens, it's sort of, it's necessary to actually lead on. And as I always say, the, the great thing about the pandemic is that with a vaccine, you could see the end of the, the light at the end of the tunnel. If the world stops because of climate, there is no coming back. Rishi, thank you. Ed, um, thank you. Very relevant question. And uh, I think a very strong response there from Rishi. I'm going to move on, if I may, to um, Dame Alsha Kemko. She's my mom. So, um, um, mommy, great to have you on. What's your question? My, my question is not going to be uh, a simple one, which is going to be answered in one minute. So, uh, first of all, good morning, everybody. What a privilege. What a privilege to listen to everyone. And Rishi, you are an entrepreneur. You are impressive. And I don't really know what else to say. Shalini has said so much. And I can hear you are a young man who has come through a long, long journey. And there is a long road ahead. My question is leadership. We are at the cusp of creating a lost generation in our country. These young people, they need inspiration. They need mentoring. They need funding. They need education and skills. We want to create new entrepreneurs. We need to do something different. I know we are talking about our businesses, our own issues, our own companies, but isn't it the time when together we come and uh, think of what else can be done. Can we, can we persuade the chancellor to use his leveling up funds to do something about um, uh, skilling and generating energy into these young people so we see a lot more entrepreneurs coming through? Thank you, Amit. So, uh, so Dame Kemka, I, I, I absolutely passionately agree with what you've said. Um, we've actually, um, and, and as soon as we're ready to sort of announce and launch it properly, uh, maybe, maybe we coordinate with, with Shalini and have a number of people who are on this call uh, help participate. But we absolutely believe that all of us as entrepreneurs have almost a responsibility and leaders in our respective areas have, have responsibility to actually mentor and provide guidance through to to sort of the, that generation, especially given the, the, the hardships which actually been created over the last, over the last year. Um, so we're putting together a whole program about mentorpreneurship. Um, so mentoring and entrepreneurship. Um, and, and it's something, as I said, that we would love to have this community involved in um, as, as we get that off the ground. Thank you, Rishi. Thank Rishi, you. we would be delighted to be involved. Um, my mother is from further education background. She ran the largest tertiary college in the UK. And this is a big problem that we're noting now, especially during COVID, is it's really inspiring our youth. So we would love to work with you. Uh, By the that. way, I, I have my own charity, the Inspire and Achieve Foundation. Yeah. We raise about 1.5 million every year and right. help those young people not in education, training or employment a team of 25 people. So I'll be very interested in your own initiative and see what we can do together. Excellent. Thank you. thank you. So Rishi, I've got to say a huge thank you. We have a lot of questions and I apologize. I know there's a lot of questions in the Q&A. There's people with their hand up. And Bruce, I'm really sorry. I will try and see if we can get a question over to Rishi's office and see if we can get a response to some of the, the questions that have been put through. We have breakout sessions now. Rishi, you have been absolutely amazing. And uh, you know what a way to start today um, with an opportunity to hear from one of the, the UK's leading entrepreneurs and unicorns. So I can't thank you enough. I also want to say a huge thank you to Richard Morris and IWG Group. A lot of these events we couldn't put on with their support. Um, and you know they're doing a huge amount to really give back to the economy in terms of supporting entrepreneurs. One of those tactics is working with us. Deal Room, as I mentioned, Doug, thank you. Some great insights there. There's a lot of people. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, you won't have to do anything. You'll be allocated into a breakout session. And my idea behind that is that you have a chance to integrate and meet the other members of our community. And the moderators have kindly agreed to share your, your names with me. And I will try and keep the small groups connected. So I'm going to say thank you to the moderators, Andrew Yates, Anita Goyle, 
um, Brad Aspas, David Coombs, Dimitri Philippou, Demetrius Hastis, um, Dinesh Damija, uh, Edward Keelan, John Hyde, CBE, um, Raj Channa, Robert Kilgower, Samantha Wildman, Sarah Roberts, Milo Steen, Fareed Huck, um, Chandani Vora, Anne Ferguson, um, Sanjeet Bhavani, Mark Rehorn, Mark, um, Thomas Schmidt, Douglas, thank you, Douglas Truffolet, Mummy, De Marsha Kemke, thank you, Sanjeet Bhavani, Sean Dolan, Dana Achor, she's our Chief Operating Officer, couldn't run the business without her, and Ismail Ibrahim. So we're going to break out into the sessions and uh, we have that until 10.30, so we've got 25 minutes for you to meet, talk about one challenge and hopefully brainstorm that challenge. I hope you enjoy it and I hope you've enjoyed this morning and thank you for having your cameras on and being dressed up. I can see some people in great backgrounds. Anita, you always look amazing. So um, thank you very much for everybody and Rishi, a huge thank you again to you for taking the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So we'll speak again soon. Okay. Um, hopefully it's going to break out now into breakout sessions. Good morning. Hi there. Um, is uh, is this, this is just a breakout session, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So, welcome to the breakout session. I, that seems to have been done quite seamlessly. So that's great news. Can we just confirm uh, how many people are in the group? Can everyone introduce themselves? So if I just go around, and everyone can introduce themselves uh, by their name, their company name and sector. And uh, also, while they're doing that, mention the biggest challenge that they're currently facing in their business, I would assume. So, uh, uh, as this is a business forum. Um, so, can I, can I do that for myself first and then hand it over to everyone? Sure. Cool. Sanjeev Bhavnani, I've known Shalini for the last uh, 10, 15 years, actually. I went to her inaugural event uh about 10 years ago uh, as i said my name is sanjeev bhavnani my company name is sb capital partners the sector is we do private investments i run a family office i've i actually knew rishi since university so we were in the same university classes 30 years ago so it was interesting to hear him speak and you know i know his whole family and it was uh, very insightful obviously I, i've known rishi for 30 years since since our degree uh, at ucl and he's come leaps and bounds and it was a great conversation uh the biggest challenge i'm currently facing is really getting back to face to face to meet clients so we work with ultra high net worth families and the biggest challenge i'm finding is that that real connection comes when you meet people face to face but i'm hoping after the pandemic uh slowly easing now over the next two three months we can finally get to do that so my main challenge is re-establishing the connection after the pandemic face-to-face uh, -face with my clients. Uh, so we advise ultra high net worth, leading families around UK and Europe and, and the world on private investments, such as, for example, investing into Oak North Bank, which we got approached by uh, five years ago. So over, over to the next person, please. I'll happily jump in. Um, I'm Gary Woodhead one of the three co-founders of Curveblock. Um, <clears throat> we are a hybrid fintech, so we are actually a fintech real estate property developer, and we're using fintech to democratize the sector and make the public the primary financial beneficiary of it. Um, my biggest problem at the moment with Curveblock, I would probably say orientates around finding strategic partnerships during the virtual world. Um, as you've just said, Sam, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, and that, that's partnerships that are complementary at bootstrapping businesses, equity, debt partnerships. Um, it has had some benefits as COVID. We got into Silicon Valley because they went virtual. So we graduated Founder Institute, but that's the biggest one at the moment is is the virtual world compared to the real. Yeah, network. so very similar to myself. So I've made a note of that. And uh, and you're in fintech, did you say? 
Yeah, so we are backed by HMRC. We are deemed as a fintech because ultimately blockchain technology is digitizing and fractionalizing the asset class. Um, so even though we are also the property developer, the primary underlying platform is fintech and the properties that we're developing to build and sell to public and private markets is an interesting one. It's known as MMC, Modern Method of Construction. And these are basically houses um, that don't require fossil fuel. So they don't require gas and they produce more surplus energy than they consume. Great, that's very interesting. We actually, funnily enough, uh, five years ago, we backed the um, uh, the modern method of construction. So we we backed a company doing modular technology in India. So we backed the first uh, first modular factory to be established in in India. So that's quite interesting. So I know a lot about that and pre uh, pre site construction. Uh, and as you know, Modular is taking off a lot again in the UK with legal and, and general. Interesting. Interesting. I wouldn't mind having a chat privately. Um, our business yeah. model yeah. is designed for global rollout. We're currently speaking with the High Commission of Canada and DIT. Yeah. The Canadian so we'd be happy with that. Uh, yeah. My name is Sanjeet Bhavnani. So you can get my details of Sh Shalini uh, Kemko, and uh, we can certainly chat about that. Yep. Thank you, Sanjeet. Great. Over to the next person, please. Another call in five minutes. So I'll quickly introduce yeah, yeah. myself. So, My name is Anuj Gupta. And uh, can you guys hear me? Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, lovely. Yes. Okay, my name is Anuj Gupta, and my I'm, I'm, I'm building an Uber of home services, and my company is called Green Van. So think of us. So we provide movers, plumbers, electricians, locksmiths to customers across the UK. And uh, so think of us like an Uber of home services. So we are... The big leap that we're making is we use tremendous amounts of AI and we are heavily focused on sustainability. So our vans are electric and the process is highly digitized. So as a result, because we automate the transaction so much, we are able to create a large margin for the various members of the ecosystem. So we pass enormous amounts of benefits to the customer, double our income for the tradesmen, have a huge play on the environment, create lots of jobs for the British economy and so on and so forth. So the idea really is we are not a marketplace, we are a service provider and uh, um, the, the, the challenge that I have right now is we are uh, unit economics positive. We're almost creating a 37% EBIT margin. But the challenge is that uh, in order to externalize the business, in order to get to you know, scale, at, you know, scale and to market the business, we need to raise, if we need to raise, we need to raise a large round. But because we don't need that much money, we don't want to do a large round. So this is where our challenge is, yeah? So be a unit economics positive, just to be clear, Sanjeev, if you, you know, the, in the finance world you mentioned. So, and, and the point is that the inherent dichotomy that we have is either we get the right, get, get a large valuation and raise a large round, but we don't need that much money to raise a large round. This is right, where we are. Right. So think about us at where Uber was in 2010 for the taxi market after the first 10,000 rides. This is where we are. So this, this is, is very common what you're mentioning, yeah. Sorry. So what is your problem then? So what is your problem? How much money are you looking to actually raise? We're looking to raise about four to six million. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's exactly the level that we, funnily enough, invest into. And, yeah. you know, I don't think, to be honest with you, I've done this for the last 20 years uh, as an entrepreneur and we help businesses grow. And it's exactly the type of business that we like to look at because, we, we just did a funding round of three to four million with another client uh, and we take on very selected projects. But I'll be happy to look at that only because I'm looking to fund the plumbing business as we speak, which is an amalgamation play. But I love your green credentials and I think it's a huge market. I mean, it's massive uh, yeah, and it's, it's not been tapped. So, yeah, it's, it's essentially know. a 30 billion TAM. Total addressable market is 30 billion. 87% of the market is completely fragmented. And, uh, you know, we're talking about delivering almost a 43% EBIT margin. So Yeah, and I like that branding. So, look, uh, that's understood. I don't think it's not a problem for me because it's what I've been doing for the last 18 years. Uh, it, it sounds as if, you know, this, this half this session is just me looking at funding all these businesses, which is great for everyone. Um, it wasn't supposed to be like that. I don't think Charlene purposely did this, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's great. Over to the next person. I know you've got to go, Nooch, but please get my details of Charlene. I mean, okay, I'll just send the LinkedIn of mine on here. And then, you know, if you can press the button, then we can connect. 
Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, send me anything as long as you've got my LinkedIn details, Sanjeet Bhavnani at SB Capital Partners. I've, I've sent a message on the chat. Would you get that? Yeah, yeah. I'll try and tap that. If not, just get my details of uh, Shalini, yeah? Okay, okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Great. Uh, over no. to the next person. Nice to talk to Anuj. Mutually. Thank you very much. So, Thank thanks. you. So I, uh, oh, I'm, uh, hello everyone. I moved to London four years ago um, from what Dublin, is, but I'm name, originally Dan, Dan Feeney. Um, okay, I've got you on my screen. As yep. it is. And yeah, that's myself with the correct Irish surname. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I um, am originally from Detroit, but the last 12 years, eight in Ireland and four here in London, I moved to London because um, I decided to invest the rest of my career in fintech. So I've spent a lot of years on various projects from payments to regulation, more in the infrastructure, more in B2B, not so much consumer. Um, I wasn't in your company, sorry. Um, Feeney what? Ventures, Feeney Ventures. Yeah. How so do you I, run, that? I, run a fee, I run a fintech advisory. I can, I can put it in the chat for you, Sanjeet. Um, yep. But, Okay. The, reason I, the reason I'm here today, um, I mentioned about the bounce back loan scandal. That's that's actually a data problem where the, the data sets were not connected up between governments and banks. And, and hopefully the lessons were learned because a lot of billions were fraudulently stolen from the taxpayer. Um, but yeah, I'm just here to learn and share. Um, it, the, the future is now, you know, fintech is the fourth kind of layer beyond internet, mobile, and, and cloud. And uh, 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 Gary, there's a company called QED Investors. They're one of the top VC firms in the world, and they're very, very active at the intersection of property and fintech. Um, the guy to speak to there is the founder, uh, Frank Rotman, R-O-T-M-A-N. -R um, he's, he's holidaying in the Caymans right now, but I'm sure he'd be keen to hear from you. And they're very active in this what you're trying to put embed money into property is what I'm hearing from you. Yeah. And the, yeah, and exactly. the That's great. financial yeah. flows. So anyway, um, yeah, happy to be here. I, I don't want to take any more time just here to share and learn. Thanks very much. Right. And uh, sorry, so what I, I didn't exactly get what your issue was rather than your ideological. My challenge was finding a tea time here in London um, on the 29th of March. Simply enough. Sorry? I'm starving to pick up. I want to find a tea time on a golf course on March 29. That's my challenge. Okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm sure we could help you with that as a team. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, I, on Sunday I was in my room and my golf clubs were literally talking to me. So anyway, I've got a bit of spring fever as well. Happy to be yeah, here. Yeah, I think we all do, and I'm sure, uh, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to solve that. Great, over to the next person. Thank you, thank you. Uh, anyone else in here? Hello, Sorry. Sanjeev. Sanjeev, yep. good morning. Good morning. Awesome, old friend, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Sanjeev. How nice. I'm actually on two screens because my other screen um, I used as a football half an hour ago, and they yeah, pushed me into another. In, they pushed me into another room. Um, so I, I still remember our, our days of fondly shipping uh, champagne in uh, Monte Carlo. Please don't, please, listen, we've got a lot of socialists on this uh, screen, so please don't talk about champagne uh, and Monte I, Carlo in the same I, breath. I, I don't care about any socialists. I'm proud of, of what I am. <laughs> so I've just spoken to Howard, who's a good friend of mine, asking what, there was a letter that you may know that went out to Lord, with him and Lord Balamura about um, not increasing capital gains and actually taking a good view about what, what increased taxation, if any, uh, should not be done so that it does not hurt entrepreneurialism or a movement of growth. And um, my, my issue is always whenever early stage companies come to me, you know, what are your three wishes? And please don't waste one of them by saying money because all of them want money. But to me, uh, my issue is the government encouraging early stage companies, uh, again, as they did with the startup loans, which was started in 2009. Um, one of my companies was a delivery partner, a major delivery partner of that. And even though the delinquency rate may have been high, uh, that definitely contributed to about 800,000 new businesses being started. Uh, and that had a causal effect by reducing unemployment, 
And many of these companies themselves ended up two or three years later employing members staff if not two. So in my view, my issue is that some of the initiatives that have been talked about and encouraged during uh, uh, lockdown, uh, during COVID, are not yet sufficient to encourage the early stage entrepreneurs to dip their, feet, their foot into the water and be encouraged by government financially to do so. So there we go. That's uh, yeah, that's very good. And can you just explain what you do, please? Uh, I know what you do. I'm a, I'm a business. I'm a business polyglot. I'm a I'm a corporate mentor. Uh, I've just fallen into that in the last 25 years, and in, uh, invested. And I've had my own companies uh, for uh, some years. Uh, property, uh, property, art, uh, a little bit of fashion. But now I'm finding that I'm the least. I'm the least technical person ever in the last 20, 25 years. Most of the businesses I'm associated with are either pure tech companies or where technology uh, is definitely the tool. And I mean, that's now true of every sector, including the arts. Which yeah, is much exactly. more it's, so, so it's, certainly, it's certainly an enabler and uh, it will be more and more so in the future, as you said. So that's interesting, but good to see you. And I'll be happy to see meet you in London face to face. Once yeah, yeah, well, I can't, I'm in my house in the country. I'm, being, I'm very lucky. I know I'm lucky that uh, the <laughs> lockdown has not been so hurtful to yeah. some people who are but stuck. When you are in the, when you are next in London, I'll be happy to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank Over you very much. Person, anyway. Please. Over to the next person, please. Is there anyone else left? Oh, uh... oh, I'll go next. Hello. Um, I'm Sharma Miller. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, and we can see your virtual mask as well, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, um, well, my background um, is paralegal, civil law, um, mostly for local authorities and also central government. Um, in recent years, though, uh, I had uh, I founded Ali Coco, which is an e-commerce platform specialised in coconut-based products. Um in uh, but since last year I've had to pivot, um, things changed, e-commerce is not the place for me, and I'm going into the assisted living um, space, um, and, which is brand new. I'm looking for, my problem or issue is um, getting a governance board, mergers and um, acquisition specialists, um, CEO, COO, that sort of thing, lawyers, accountants, and uh, I'm just trying to keep it as brief as possible. So yeah, I've um, gone into assisted living care homes. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we know the sector very well. What exactly, uh, what exactly is your role within assisted living? Are you buying the units? Are you uh, all, all Yeah, right yeah, them? buying the unit. And yeah, you, buying them, you, yeah. Manager operated you, units, yeah, manager yeah, operated. Yeah, yeah. That's something we actually are a specialist in. We, uh, we've looked at this model in Europe, actually, and we were approached recently for assisted living. We've done a lot of research into it, and we, we had a $100 million funding from the US from a hedge fund to operate this in Europe. But unfortunately, that collapsed in Lehman Brothers. So, I, again, I'll be happy to, to chat to you, and I'm sure other people in the group could help you as well, maybe, depending on their expertise. Thank you. Great. Uh, is, is there anyone else left on the call? Yeah, hi, um, Sanjeet. Hi I, can, hi, I can just briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Manish Tiwari, and I run an advertising and marketing company called Here and Now 365. I focus on multicultural marketing. And for me, the challenge obviously has been the infusion of tech in the business. So I'm kind of trying to go up the learning curve and integrate those things. Uh, Right now, I'm planning to launch a product, which is uh, basically uh, kind of an interface which let businesses in the marketing world get an insight into multicultural marketing, gives them uh, info about what the competition is doing in their sector, and gives them all the basic tools. So if they buy into this product, they pretty much know. So if you're Asda, you know what Morrison's or Tesco is doing, if you are, uh, you know, uh, John Lewis, you know what the other retailers are doing. So that's the idea and that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, 
obviously because I don't come from a tech background, so there's a little bit of steep learning for me here, but uh, hopefully uh, this should amount to something. And, and what exactly is your problem then? Uh, so problem is obviously uh, getting the product right, getting the right kind of mentors, because I need those inputs. And uh, obviously uh, right now I'm funding it myself, but at some stage I would need uh, investment. Great. Um, again, you know, we, I do a lot of mentorship. I work yep. with a lot of CEOs of, of leading brands and companies. <clears throat> I'm actually personally very interested in this. I'm about to launch my own brand agency as well to do strategic partnerships. And we've been very successful so far in that. So right. I'd be happy to try and work with you. Absolutely, Sanjeet. So I'll get in touch with you. And yeah. uh, let's see if we can find a call. That'd be a pleasure. Huh? That'd be a pleasure. Anyone else on, on, on the call? No, I think that's it. So great. I did it exactly on time at 1030 because I know everyone's got a very strict schedule. Thanks for everyone for dialing in. I think it was an excellent talk by both um, <clears throat> what was Regis and then uh, Rishi Kosla. Uh, my old uh, university friend and great insights for, uh, and great questions from the audience and also uh, from Shalini Kemka and indeed uh, seems her mum that I think gave a great insight into uh, what she's doing for younger younger adults. And uh, <clears throat> we look forward to the next session. Were there any other questions or any other comments before we log out? I think that's that's a wrap then. Can I, uh, can I, can I just add, ask you, Sanjay, you mentioned you have some interest in your portfolio in FinTech. What are you hoping from the FinTech review being published? Uh, I, yeah, so why don't we go over that separately? I mean, we, 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 we're opportunistic. So we look at all types of companies such as advertising, FinTech, everything so you know what we're looking for is what we can discuss when we meet face to face because uh, i don't want it to be a singular discussion so no but what i um, meant was the the policy you know you know cameron and osborne set up london as a fintech hub and here we are post brexit post covid and there's an important document this friday called the fintech review do you have any thoughts about that are you waiting to read what it says no, no, I'm just waiting to read one. I mean, to, typically, it's a good question. Uh, typically, those government reviews are very broad brush. Uh, I think the UK is definitely been doing its best with Silicon Valley and everything else. Thank you. But it also thank you. Shalini, Shalini, thank you very much. Well done. Excellent. Thanks, Dimitri, for, for keeping it together. <laughs> Yeah, I thanks have, to. I was I was wondering if somebody was recording that and it could go down as Jackie Weaver. You've got no authority here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's not the Paris Council. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shalini. If you're still on, thanks for another great. Meeting. Yeah, th thanks to everyone, and uh, uh, look forward to say. Uh, was Was there anything you wanted to say, Oliver? Uh, no, I just thought. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm on two screens, and they were asking me a question. Listen. I think these sessions are excellent. I'm not pushing you. I actually have a company where, which with technology, where these meets these meets will be even more um, similar to real physical meetings, uh, rather than actually still having to rely on online. But I must say this this particular one has been one of the best I've seen because I've been trying yeah, to get I into, yeah, into meeting. I've been trying to get into meeting rooms where either I'm actually the person to be speaking, and the chair's gone, as they say, or the door's locked, or something like that. So yeah, these social networking yeah, things have still got a long way to go technologically till they yeah, really work. I think, uh, I think this one has been very seamless, as you said. And just going back to the previous question. I think, you know, a lot of the government things are broad brush, but, you know, the benefits are being seen. Unfortunately, at the local bureaucratic level, a lot of local authorities are not dispersing the grants. A lot of people still need a proper mentorship as being brought up by the group. Um, but also funding is very important from the right type of people. It's not just the money, but it's getting it from the right type of people that want to help you grow your business and uh, share your aims. Otherwise, it'll be a complete uh, disaster. Great. On that note, um, I will wish everyone all the best and uh, look forward to the next uh, session. Excellent. Well done, Sanji. Excellent session. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Um, lovely to see everybody. Thanks, Sanji.
and uh, okay. uh, we're going to switch off the rooms now. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and by the way, the share notes. your emails. Okay. Yeah, and I've Thank made you. all the notes as well, uh, which I'll send to Shalini and Ibrahim. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Sanjeev. Thank you. Congratulations on your engagement, by the way, Sanjeev. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gary, yeah. nice to see you as well. And Oliver, lovely to see you. Stephen, we need to switch off all the rooms now. Please.